Good morning. Welcome to day two of the Gradle Summit. This is my third year at the Gradle Summit. I think the third year of the Gradle Summit. So it's pretty exciting to see the uh, attendance grow every year. New companies, uh, old companies come here. And what I want to talk about today is software engineering in the continuous age. So in your programs, you'll see that the title says software development in the continuous age. And I was working through this yesterday, I realized that that phrasing was important, development versus engineering. And I'll talk later on why, what the distinction is and why I decided to change that one word. So my name is uh, Jens Pilgrim Larsen. I work in the tools engineering team at LinkedIn. Our mission is essentially to, to support our software development organizations and build all of the software uh, products that LinkedIn creates. So let me start with delivering software products. In the end, that's what we all do. That's what all of our businesses uh, do. It's, it could be a mobile application. It could be a web service. It could be a boxed up software product. But in the end, we all need to deliver some software product to an internal user, a developer, to a customer, to a member. And this, this concept of delivering software products is very much been a transition over the past five years. And that mirrors my own personal or professional transition. So it started off with waterfall. You have discrete phases where there's a handoff of, of different interfaces, different uh, documents, and then working software. So you start off with the requirements. And there's a product requirements document. For anybody who's worked in a co pure waterfall company, this is where you, in the end, argue about where the commas go. And you invest a tremendous amount of thought into this very large document, saying this is what our products are going to do for, let's say, the next 12 or 18 months. So I worked on these things in, in a leadership position at an aerospace and defense software company. And it was ridiculous how much time we spent on this thing knowing full well that everything it said was not going to survive actual reality. And in three months, we were going to have to redo it all because some big customer was going to ask us a new, new give us a new requirement. And then we passed this product requirements document to the design phase. Here you have some anointed set of very senior technical folks who translate the requirements into a software architecture that then gets passed off and say, OK, now we're going to implement that software architecture before it gets handed off again to do verification and finally to you know, maintenance or, or customer support. And this very much mirrored the way that we structured our organizations, our businesses. There were you know, product managers. There still are, in a lot of companies, product managers, marketing folks who are responsible for the product requirements document. There is the architect with a capital A. So these are typically folks who used to be software developers, and now they have been so good at doing software development that obviously we must move them to a different role so that they can't you know, do the things that they love and are good at anymore. So then we have our architects. So I, I, I have, uh, I work with some people who, who used to, in the LinkedIn buildings, they used to be SGI, and they talk about this, the architect, you know, the architectural committee, right? And then you have the software developers, and this is where, when I talked about changing the title of the talk between software development and software engineering, it's a distinction. Because the architects would pass off the architecture to the software developers, and they would actually translate that into working code. But they wouldn't worry about whether that actually worked, you know, things like testing or anything like that. No, that was the domain of the QA organization. And then the QA organization said, OK, we blessed this release. Let's put it, put it out there. And now it becomes operations or customer support owns the next cycle. And so you have these discrete phases, discrete roles. I don't know if anybody, I, as I said, I was in an aerospace and defense company where this was an 18-month cycle. So I was there for five and a half years, and I did three releases. And it just, it's awful. That's why I do what I do today, was because I lived through this for five and a half years. 
So then we said, okay, well, this is awful and it's way too, the cycles are way too long. What if we just create lots and lots of small cycles? And we take a verb, being agile, something good, being agile is good. There's, you know, it's an action. And then we just, we, we make it a process. We put a capital A on it. That must make that, that must make us more agile, the verb. It turns out it doesn't. It makes no difference. It just makes the cycle faster. But the same friction, the same pain is in the process. There's still discrete faces. There's still discrete roles. And then comes this wonderful, wonderful adjective, continuous. So now you're really thinking about changing the way that we deliver software products. This is the, the, really the sea change. And so last year, Gradle Summit was all about continuous delivery. And you have continuous integration, and you have continuous deployment. And that's why I call this the continuous age. Because it's this, this merging of all the different discrete steps and roles into a software engineering role. Understanding that in a microcosm, these faces happen all the time. You have an interface, and you're implementing that interface. That requires all of the previous steps to a very large software product, again, at a macro level, requires those steps. And the, per, the people doing that, they're doing all of them today. Um, if you're familiar with the, the changes uh, Satya and Adele have, have instituted at Microsoft after taking over from Steve Ballmer, that's the first thing he did. He called it the merge with a capital M. Essentially took all of the different roles and merged them into the software engineering role. So suddenly, you know, people who had large QA organizations, they're now engineers, software engineers. Same thing at LinkedIn. We are moving away from QA roles and into software engineering. So let's dive a little bit deeper. Why is this adjective so awesome? So I love this first, uh, this first bullet on continuous. Uninterrupted in time without cessation. And when you think about software businesses, when you think about software companies, the only time that they stop changing, the only time when, when there's, there's a slowdown, when, when things are static, is when they die, or software products, it's when they die, right? Other than, than death, we are uninterrupted in time without cessation. There is no, there's no stop. LinkedIn is 24-7, 365. Google, 24-7, 365. Apple, etc. It is, that is the key thing, is that there, is, there aren't these discrete steps. It's just a continuous cycle of improvement, innovation, creativity, change. And then the other thing is it's being an immediate connection to what came before. It's, build, it's not this big bang all the time. There's, you're building on what the previous version did. You're building on what the previous uh, product did. So if you think about the iPhone, the iPhone will die at some point. I know it's hard to imagine today, but there will be a world without iPhones. But today we're what, on the iPhone 6? And I think without a doubt, the iPhone 6 is better than the iPhone 5, was better than the iPhone 4, etc. So as we keep going, we are building on the past generation. And then the great, the last thing also becomes important, it's progressive. It's new, it's, it, it, it's again making incremental improvements, it's moving forward. So I just think that continues is the absolute perfect word to use for what we are trying to accomplish with software delivery. And for me, having worked in a place for five and a half years where everything was driven by this magical release date, we had picked, you know, 18 months in advance, we had picked this date, we are going to ship on this date 18 months in advance, and that drove all of our decision making. And it was really bad decision making because of it. Because everything was, are we going to get this in by the release date or are we not? And we were trying to think 18 months ahead in, uh, uh, of time 
when we couldn't even predict what a week or a month looked like. So continuous delivery has killed the release date and that has been really a tremendous accomplishment. It has made things so much easier. Um, this is why I came to LinkedIn. This is, we don't have release dates at LinkedIn. We just, we just ship every day, every, all the time is a release date. So that's great. We're done, right? We have climbed, we have gone from discrete steps to continuous. We're shipping everything as soon as it's ready. We're automating everything. We've climbed to the top of the mountain and now we're just traversing to a slightly higher peak. No? Yes? Well, if we had, that would be awesome. I would be very happy and be looking for some new challenge to take on. But there's something missing. So if we, if we take these, these steps of the software development life cycle, the software product life cycle, and we look at continuous delivery, we really talk about these two phases, testing and deployment. We talk about what happens after a software engineer has made changes and pushed those changes into the repository. That's when the continuous delivery pipeline kicks in. But there's more to software engineering than actually delivering the product. And it turns out, if you, if you take this diagram to its conclusion, those things actually matter for the delivery process. The delivery process starts with the requirements. It's certainly the design affects delivery. You need to design your software so that it can be tested. You need to design your interfaces so that you can build good unit tests, so you can mock out things. And then certainly as you are coding, as you're doing development, you need to think about how, how will this affect the testing, the deployment, and the user experience. So they're all connected. What we need to do now, at least at LinkedIn, and I think with Gradle and a lot of the other tools that I see as well, is focus on the whole picture. And this is again where the distinction between software development and software engineering comes in. Engineering is a craft. And mastery of that craft is really, really hard. It is a really, really challenging to be a good software engineer today. Much more so than in the past waterfall world where an architect gave you a design and you needed to implement that as a software developer. Now you're responsible for the entire life cycle. And we need to build tools and processes that help with all of those different steps of the life cycle and inside them. So I want to talk again a little bit about kind of the word definition. Why, why is engineering so important? This is again, this is just, engineering to me is an awesome term. It's why I, I became a software engineer. It was because I loved tinkering growing up. I loved playing with computers. I loved playing with cars. I loved playing with anything that I could take apart and put together. So this concept of devising cleverness. I mean, that's, that's a pretty cool thing when you say, what do you, you know, what do you do? What have you devoted your professional life to? You know, I, I contrive or device cleverness. I, I think about tinkering. So I know Hans yesterday in his keynote, he had a picture of himself as a little, little kid with an early computer. And back in 1987, I had my first, you know, little IBM PC and started playing around with that, playing games, doing coding. And this is what it's really all about, to use the apply, in our case, scientific and practical knowledge in order to invent, design, build, maintain, research, and improve, again, in our case, devices and processes. And that's a key thing. We're not just building software. We're building the process so that next time we need to build a software product, we can do so better. So we're continuously improving on the process. And this is what engineering is all about. Craftsmanship is becoming a hot topic in uh, software engineering and software product delivery. 
I love this picture. I took it from, from Baron Roberts craftsmanship uh, slide deck at LinkedIn. So we actually have a slide deck that talks about what does it mean to be a software craftsman. But if you think about it, this is the very basic woodworking tools. But you can tell from them that they're beautifully done. They're well crafted. I bet you if you held them, it would feel good. They would be well balanced. The steel is of good quality. The wood is of good quality. And using them, a woodworking craftsman could create beautiful things and, and well-crafted things. And this is what, this is the difference. If you, if you think about going to the Home Depot and buying the cheapest set of chisels or buying this, this is the difference between a rock star software developer and a just a, a general software developer or an average software developer. And that's why these folks that we talk about in the industry as, as kind of rock star developers are so sought after because they can change the whole game. So again, it's, it's hard to do. Um, and it's very, it's, it's very personal, it's very emotional. I know the software that I write, if somebody comes in and says, you know, Dude, WTF, come on, man. That, I take that personally. I mean, it's part of me. The, the, my, my craft is part of who I am. And I think this, this I don't know, I, at least I've been in code reviews where this is exactly the way that we interact with each other. Dude, WTF, come on. What is this? I would have used, at, inside LinkedIn, I would have used harsher language, but... We're in a public forum and they're taping me, so. <laughs> so why is this so hard? Well, so we're asking software engineers to worry about all of these things. Think about all of these dimensions as you're going through in your everyday life. As I said, at a macro level, as you're designing big features, as you're designing big software products, just think about all of these things. And then, once you've finished thinking, oh yeah, that all of those things, by the way, we're gonna ask you to do this for three or four different software platforms, right? Let's, let's just say, you know, you might need some HTML, CSS, SAS, um, you know, probably a little bit of Angular and then some Ember. You're gonna do that, you know, on iOS and Android and mobile web and, you know, different form factors. And then you're going to do the server side, and you're going to worry about is it a Gradle or Maven or Ant. And yeah, so, you know, have fun with that. You know, you just got out of school, and they taught you how to, you know, take a interface and implement it in Java. And here you go, right? So we, we definitely at LinkedIn, I mean, we throw people, software engineers, into the deep end. And we tell them, oh, you're now responsible for everything from idea to production. And if it goes down at 3 o'clock on Saturday, guess what? We're going to page you, and you're going to have to be responsible for fixing it. So I think we can help. I think we in this room can do a lot to make this better, to make this easier. And there had to be an obligatory. There's two things in every slide deck. Snoopy has to be in there, and Borat has to be in there. So that's the primer for, you know, watch for Borat. But it's, it's, not, it's not easy, um, and it's also, I think, the big reason why a lot of people want to see their ideas manifested in technology. They have ideas, they have product ideas, they want to build an app, they want to build a software product, and they want to go, they want to have a computer science degree, they want to have a STEM degree, but they, they jump off that track at some point because they've realized that, wow, I'm going to have to understand very low level basic uh, computer science and, and uh, computer fundamentals, and that's not easy. So what can we do to make this better? Let me start with the easy one. So uh, I'm, it was awesome that Luke did the, the demo of the continuous mode in Gradle yesterday because it kind of tied the two keynotes together, so I love that. We did not plan that, by the way. But essentially, the way that we can make things easier, one of the ways that we engineer is through abstractions. When there's something that's very complex and very, has very many dimensions under the hood, let's build an abstraction that can make it easier for people to understand uh, 
that abstraction and not worry about, we'll take care of the lower layer stuff. So tasks is an awesome abstraction. So that's when, when I first started learning about tasks in Gradle and the fact that they have you know, input, action, output was when I first started triggering my mind that Gradle was really something we can build on. So if you have this abstraction, everybody understands this abstraction and it's incredibly powerful. Almost anything in a software development pipeline you can do using this abstraction with the caveat that your inputs and outputs might be empty. But still, with this framework, you can do it. And then I think, hopefully, I've set the stage that discrete, not so good, continuous, good, right? So automated, continuous feedback, automated, continuous tasks helps people because it gives them the feedback earlier. It gives them feedback that when they change something, what did it affect? Because that's one of the hard things when you talk about software product delivery is, well, I changed something. What, did it, what, what was the manifestation of that code change? I went from some opaque you know, uh, string on a screen, some text, and it turned into this application, this UI, et cetera. So it turns out that we already had a vocabulary to talk about this. Play run, Ember serve, um, the using, for example, Ember serve uses Facebook Watchman under the hood, Gradle dash dash continues that we just added. There must be something here if these technologies, if these frameworks, if these platforms are all thinking about how can I make it easier for the developer to understand what their change affects. So that's the easy one. Hopefully I've convinced you that, that moving to a continuous automated feedback model is much better than a discrete model. So let's talk about infinite scalability. So first of all, computer scientists tend to also be math people. And they're like, well, there is no infinite scalability. Like there's the, the internet is still finite. Well, so let's define a proxy for infinite in this context is Amazon Web Services. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say, if your automation workflow requires more computing resources than Amazon Web Services can provide, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> so let, let's use this as a proxy. And by the way, if your business cannot afford computing resources, you're doing something wrong. Like you need to raise some money, you need to sell some, like otherwise you don't have a viable business. I mean, this is crazy. This is, look at the, at the, at the, at the rightmost column. Hardware is commodity. Computers are commodity. Incredibly powerful computers with tons and tons of memory, uh, solid state disks, com uh, CPU horsepower. We should never ever wonder you, about the trade-off of engineering human time versus machine time. We should always optimize for human time at this point going forward. And it's just getting more, it's just getting cheaper as well. So there's the Borat reference. What, why do we need this infinite scalability? Why do we need the ability to throw hardware, to throw computers at a complex problem? And that comes with this feedback in human time. The, the value of the feedback degrades the, the slower the feedback comes. So a simple example would be if you change a Java file and five hours later the tooling tells you that you broke a unit test with your change, that feedback is not very valuable at all. Five minutes, still not very valuable. Five seconds, yeah, it's getting to be pretty valuable. Five milliseconds or instant, yeah, it, it's valuable. So with these complex workflows, we now need to be able to provide this feedback in some reasonable time for the software engineer. And to do that, the only way that we know is to throw hardware at the problem. So we need, this is where um, Hans was talking yesterday about the new configuration model starts the road to distributed task execution. This is why. We have builds at LinkedIn that can take several minutes, tens of minutes. We need to get all of those under a minute. 
And the way to do that is to throw hardware at the problem. The other thing that this will enable us to do is not worry about what device we're doing the actual software engineering on. So, I, I mean, I, I have a MacBook Pro, and I can do most software development on that. Um, but sometimes I actually do software development on an iPad. I would love to do software development on any kind of device, and I would certainly not want to be tethered to a very high-powered machine computer sitting under my desk. I actually would like to spend the least amount of time at my desk as possible, and most of my time here doing my job. So I think that as we, as we move forward again, we want to move from this, this corporate environment and the desks and the open landscape. We want to move to lounges. We want to move to the beach. We want to be able to, to take our engineering anywhere. And the way that we can do that is to put the actual, the, the, computer, the complex workflows that require a lot of computing resources happen remotely from the device that we're actually using to interface with that system. So we have some cool tools coming up at LinkedIn, uh, some which I think we should open source, to connect very low-powered po devices to uh, high-powered computers sitting in uh, data centers and making it appear like you're, you're developing locally, but actually it's all being synced and, and underneath the hood using tooling. This is what I mean about tooling and process. We can really change. We can make things a lot easier for people. So we can run everything continuously and automated, any complexity of scale, and give feedback in human time. Now we need some way of presenting that information to the engineer, to the user. So we started this, this project at LinkedIn, Aid, an IDE that does everything. And you might wonder, well, why does he have an Acme catalog from Looney Tunes on this slide? So one of the, the uh, although never uh, officially recognized by Warner Brothers that it is, one of the uh, terminologies used for Acme from Looney Tunes is a company that makes everything. So that's why the, the idea for Aid and IDE that does everything came from. So remember, we're asking the software engineer to think about all of these things. So we need to provide an interface to provide information about all of these things to the engineer. And you're starting to see this. You have actually seen this for several years coming up. Uh, the first two slides here are actually uh, from Android Studio, which I think is perfect give, given this context. So you see Android Studio has already started taking this idea and moving it forward. In this case, it's API documentation. So as you are writing code, you are getting API. You're getting valuable information in line with what you're trying to do in, in real time in an automated, continuous way. So this means you don't have to open up a separate browser, open up the Java doc, and you know search for the, this method and, and look at the documentation. You get it where you need it and when you need it. And then on the, on the other side is, I make a change, what, what, what manifested that change or what, what effect did that change have? And then one of the things I mentioned earlier was, you know, you may need six different form factors or so six different devices. So I make this change, and now you can automatically see the change, what it did. I might have something running. At LinkedIn, we have a lot of Java services running. So the developer might have something running. How is that service behaving? As I make changes, how does the service, how does the JVM do? And when I make some change that significantly altered the performance of, of the JVM in a good or a bad way, how do I immediately detect it? So alerts, dials, gauges, etc. And then comes the, the something that really kills both the experience and productivity is when you need to move into an asynchronous workflow. So you think you're good, you've tested your change, you think it's good, and now they mandate that you need to get a code reviewed. 
And that could be an hour, it could be a day, it could be a week, it could be you trying to run after people and saying, oh, please, please help me, like, ship my code. So we need to provide valuable information about these things. We need this, to abstract this from the engineer so that they can see the relevant feedback as it's coming in. And to be good citizens, we provide them information about incoming review requests that they can act on directly through that. So again, it's, it's a difference between having to go to a browser window and keep refreshing it to see, like, did someone look at my review? Did someone do something with my review? And that information just happens automatically and comes to you. And one thing we really struggle with at LinkedIn is, okay, well, I shipped, I, I pushed my code, I've got it reviewed, I pushed it, what happened to it? I mean, in one case, it's, you know, something failed during the continuous delivery pipeline. And then there are different alerts and things and actions that you're supposed to do. But even if it's all running fine, where is my change? What's happening to it? If I push a, a change into a library, who's picked up that change? What's going on with it? Again, it's providing relevant information to the, to the engineer in the, in the place where they're working. Okay, so we have the ability to continuously and automate to provide feedback for any complexity of workflow from anywhere to the place where the developer is, is or engineer is developing code anyway. So I think that, that fills out all of, of the bubbles in the software development lifecycle. We're there, we understand requirements, we understand design, we understand coding, testing, verification, the entire cycle is modeled through tooling. And we talked about, well, all of this tooling obviously is based on, on you know, software as it is today, software programming languages. It's, it's fundamentally text. And you need to map, one of the complexities is you need to map that text to a behavior. So you need to know that your Java code will end up doing something. You need to know your Android code will end up looking a specific way when running the client. So our target audience right now for the next one to two years are software engineers, people who have lots and lots of education, training on doing software engineering. But fundamentally, that's just a stepping stone. This is an iPad application called Hopscotch. It's uh, targeted for children, typically starting at about age seven. And I can tell you I have young children of my own and they intuitively, at one year old, understand how to swipe and interact with iOS and Android applications. It, it is something fundamental in us that they understand if they take a block and they move it around and they see the effect of that, they pick it up instinctively, intuitively. So this is a way, th this application, I, I encourage everyone to go play with this, this hopscotch application for programming to understand how easy programming can be and how hard it is today and, and how big that gap is. Because the fundamental, the target audience that I'm shooting for are these two. So this is Madeline, age three, uh, Isabella, aged one. I want to build tooling and a software development platform. Now, I'm not going to shortchange them. They may decide to become software engineers, do the, all the training, understand, you know, Python and C and registers and CPUs and everything. But they may not. They may just want to see their ideas manifested in technology. And I want to provide them tooling and a platform that even if they don't go through all of those, those hurdles to become an engineer, they can use intuitively to build great software products. Thank you very much. <laughs>